In the last lecture, I tried to situate Hegel in the context of ancient Greek philosophy. I showed how Hegel challenged the idea that being or essences could be considered stable. I showed how he considered being as well as essences as undergoing dialectical transformation. And next, I tried to show Hegel in the context of the German idealistic movement in philosophy. Um, I sh tried to show how Immanuel Kant came as a great synthesizer between the rationalists and empiricists of his time, kick-starting in a certain sense the German idealist movement in terms of philosophy. And Hegel really comes at the apex, climax or culmination of this great um, idealist movement in Germany. So I explained how nearly all the idealists were of the view that there is an absolute, the absolute, a first principle that helps us understand how the world is ordered. And this really is the task that Hegel also sets himself to. But Hegel, taking up from Kant, agrees with Kant that our minds have access only to the ideas of the world. But he also disagrees with Immanuel Kant and he points out that these ideas are not individual but must be social. In other words, Kant placed the individual person in relation to the thing in itself, whereas Hegel considers that ideas are always evolving dialectically by conversations that are going on, not just, or, or thought processes that are going on, not just between the thing in itself and the individual, but conversations that are going on between various individuals that result in the collective consciousness of humanity. Hence, for Hegel, there are really three modes of consciousness, and this should come as no surprise because obviously Hegel here is once again utilizing the dialectical triad to explain how knowledge is built. And then in turn, he will utilize these categories to explain how nature and history operate. So the first and foremost is sense certainty, where the individual uh, minds uh, or the individual mind attempts to grasp the nature of the thing in itself. This attempt to understand the thing in itself results in the creation of certain universal categories on the basis of sense certainty. This is what Hegel refers to as the first stage. In the next stage, the individual, of course, is not simply standing directly opposite other objects, but also mediates between individuals and the collective understanding, that is, between his immediate perceptions and the ideas about the world that he shares with society. Perceptions are the categories of thought worked out between individuals through a common language. So I have an idea about what I'm looking at. I create a certain category, a certain universal category for that particular object. I say I'm looking at a table. Someone else comes along and says, actually, that's not a table, that's a chair, or that's a specific kind of table, or alters that concept in some particular way. And then, of course, the two different perceptions that we have about one particular object, the thing in itself that we are viewing, on the basis of which we have created universal thoughts, universal categories, may come into contradiction. And when they do come into contradiction, another process occurs, which is the process of understanding. The differences between perceptions give rise to a state of uncertainty. We find, that is, humanity finds new grounds for certainty by generating new concepts that smooth over these contradictions. Hence, universal categories continuously evolve through a dialectical process between senses and essences and between individual and collective consciousness. In other words, there is a double dialectic going on over here. The dialectic of an individual viewing the thing in itself, the object that lies outside of the person, forming a certain perception about that, forming certain universal categories about that. But then the individual is not standing in relation to the object alone. There are other individuals who, that are also viewing the object. And then I share my perception with other individuals. I am, of course, forced to rethink my perception of that thing in light of other people's perception of that thing when the two perceptions contradict each other. And it is only through this particular contradiction that we reach a synthesis, that we continuously move forward, that we generate a process of understanding. So the process of understanding, the process of the movement of consciousness is a product of the double dialectic between the individual and the thing in itself, but also between the individual and society or between individual and other individuals of a given society. 
This double dialectic is really the foundation of Hegel's understanding of history even. Hegel explains that the German term for history is derived from the verb to happen. And this is of course analogous to the idea of becoming the synthesis of being and nothingness. Everything present contains therefore for Hegel some elevated aspect of the past because everything that exists today in the way in which we think is nothing is arising out of a dialectical sublation of the past. Therefore, it maintains some element of, of the past, but that element has been dialectically sublated. In other words, what Hegel means is that the logical parts of the past, the aspects of past theory that were logical, that were in line with reason and rationality, etc., are transferred forward into the more complex ideas of the present. The present contains always elements of the past. But how does this impact history? How does this result in the forward movement of society? Hegel will illustrate how history moves forward in this subject-object dialectic by a very famous passage in the phenomenology of mind called the master-slave dialectic. This is on the one hand a hypothetical example but can also be read as a literal example. On the one hand of course we had slavery, we had masters and slaves in history. On the other hand um, we are not necessarily talking about slavery in the economic sense but we may also be talking about slavery in a broader intellectual sense or in the sense of recognition and self-recognition. You'll understand this as I continue. Now, Hegel begins by explaining to us that consciousness of an object necessarily implies self-consciousness. If I am looking at an object, if I'm aware of myself looking at an object, if I'm aware that there is an object, that means that I'm aware of the object being separate from myself, as being something outside of myself. That could only come about if I'm aware of what I am, that, or rather aware that I am versus an object that exists outside of myself. Now, Hegel refers to the object that we are thinking about simply as the object in Hegelian terms and in post-Hegelian philosophy as a whole. The term object means anything that is unthinking, that is not conscious. And what does Hegel refer to as the element that is doing the thinking? He calls it the subject. Uh, we, can, we often think of subject in terms of a, a particular discipline, but here Hegel is referring to the term subject as something that has subjectivity, that is able to think, that is as an entity that is able to thinking, uh, is able to think, is able to have self-consciousness. So any self-conscious entity is a subject, any entity that has no self-consciousness is essentially an object. Hegel says that it's all very simple when we are talking about the relationship between a subject and a pure object. We look at objects that exist in the material world, we pick them up, we throw them. If we have a ball, we can throw it. If we have a tree, we can cut it. If we have a mountain, you know, if you look at a mountain, we may want to climb it, etc. In other words, we are able to manipulate, for better or for worse, the objects that exist in the material world. But what happens when a subject, a thinking being, a self-conscious being, confronts another thinking being, not an object, but here another self-conscious being. Hegel says that at the human level, individuals only become self-consciousness when recognized by another. Hence, subjects are also objects to other subjects and one becomes aware of oneself by seeing oneself through the eyes of another. Why is this the case? Why would a subject only become aware of oneself as a subject by seeing oneself through the eyes of another? Hegel says that what differentiates humanity from objects is the fact, or even from animals for that matter, is the fact that we can conceive of ourselves as a subject. We know ourselves as thinking self-conscious beings. And we differentiate ourselves from objects by the simple fact that we are self-conscious. We not only create categories about the various objects that we see in the world, but we create universal categories about the very thing that is looking at all the different objects in the world that is ourselves. And that really is what differentiates humanity from everything else that exists. Hence, when one subject confronts another subject, one self-conscious thinking being confronts another subject, here 
there is a moment of identification with the other subject. When two subjects confront each other, the subject, says Hegel, are astounded at the realization of the self as a foreign object. What does this mean? Hegel is saying that the first thing that happens is that you recognize that the thing that is standing, the entity that is standing in front of you is not just an object like all the other objects that one can manipulate, but is a thinking being, is a subject. Yet, that subject is standing outside of ourselves. That means it is also an object to myself in the sense that it is outside of myself. Now this creates a peculiar contradiction that on the one hand I can recognize at some level that this is a subject, it's a thinking being just like myself. On the other hand it is foreign to me, it is outside of myself, it is therefore to my consciousness at this, la at this stage nothing but an object. So this, what this contradiction brings about at the first stage of the dialectic is that the subject fails to recognize the self in the other. Each views the other as an object rather than as a subject. Hegel says they become mesmerized by each other and attempt to assert their will on the other. It is just like looking at a mirror, Hegel tells us. When we look at a mirror, we are able to see that we are looking at something that looks exactly like us and when we move our hands, etc., you know, the image also does exactly the same. We are able to, whatever our will is, we are able to assert that will on what is being reflected back at us. But when we look at another subject, we see the reflection of ourselves in that subject and yet we are not able to assert our will on that uh, other subject because that subject has a will of its own. Why would we want to impose a will on uh, our will on that other subject, Hegel asks. Well, what would be the, uh, you know, what would be the purpose of doing something of that sort? Well, the purpose of imposing our will on that subject is nothing other than that subject recognizing us also as subjects because that is essentially what distinguishes hu human beings from all the other things that exist in the world, all the other objects that exist in the world. Hence to be recognized as a human by another human being is the really one of the most essential requirements uh, that a human being feels, uh, Hegel says. It's part of our, almost part of our human nature, Hegel would say. So what happens when a subject approaches another subject in Hegel's own words is on approaching the other it has lost its own self since it finds itself as another being. Secondly, it has thereby sublated that other for this primitive consciousness does not regard the other as essentially real but sees its own self in the other. On the one hand I see that there is another thinking being outside of myself. On the other hand, I, I am only seeing that what exists outside of myself is yet but another version of myself. Thus, Hegel says, each subject treats the other as an object. Each subject treats the other as an object in the sense that each subject wishes to impose its will on the thinking being that out exists outside of ourselves in much the same way as we would treat an object. We, treat an object in the sense that we are able to manipulate it, we are able to use it for our ends and we want to utilize what exists outside of ourselves, that subject, in much the same way that we utilize an object to achieve a particular purpose. What is that purpose? The purpose is that that subject should recognize me as a subject, that subject should recognize me as a thinking being, that subject should recognize me as being essentially different from all the other things that exist in the world. But now since both subjects are attempting to do, to do this and both subjects are attempting to assert their will on the other, this leads to a struggle, it leads to a contradiction. And Hegel says this contradiction escalates. It escalates into a struggle to the death, he says. Each side is imposing its will to be recognized as, the, as a thinking being. Finally, one side triumphs and becomes the master the other submits and becomes the slave. The master is recognized by the slave. The master therefore becomes independent of the slave. The slave, of course, becomes dependent on the master. The master sees the slave as an object, no longer as a subject. The master frustrates the desire of the slave to see himself as a subject. What does all of this mean? And how, do we, how can we situate this in real life? How, what experience do you have of this? in real life. Well, I always like to say that imagine when two people meet, what, what, do, what, do, what happens 
when two people who are unfamiliar with each other meet up. In a certain sense, in civilized society, they size each other up. They, two, when two athletes meet, they will try to size each other up in, in the sense of they may ask each other or they may tell each other or give each other information about you know, their achievements and you know, how quickly they can run their 100 meters, what is the time for 100 meters or, or, or whatever. When two intellectuals meet, they will try to establish which of the two intellectuals is better read or better informed, etc. When two politicians meet, they might uh, name drop, they might say, you know, who, are they, who they are connected to, who they had lunch with last week. When two industrialists meet, they might try to size each other up in terms of their economic strength. When two people who pride themselves on their looks meet, they might try to size each other up on their looks, and so on and so forth. Whatever it is that those people value, they try to size each other up on those particular things. But what is going on underneath all of this uh, you know, sort of uh, superstructure really, is that both are trying to get the other to acknowledge themselves as being thinking beings, as being recognized as self-conscious beings, as being beings that are able to create, whether in the uh, whether they are creating in the way of economics or politics or industry or art or literature or sports or whatever it is, but that the other person ought to recognize that this person as a creative being. Now, Hegel would point out that this is going, this process occurs in civilized society without any physical violence where we sort of confront each other and we establish who is the master and who is the slave. Uh, you know, by these dialogues and discussions that escalate to the point until one or the other person submits. But I also like to think of that wonderful movie, The Planet of, uh, the, Planet of the Apes, where when the apes fight each other, one ape finally submits out of physical violence and the other ape puts his hand on top and says, all right, I will be the master and you will be the slave. And the violence comes to an end. So the slave is stuck in a position of reflecting on himself or herself as a subject. And by the way, one can, uh, you know, Simone de Beauvoir took this very idea of self-recognition and applied it to, you know, to the relationships between, or the relationship between the genders, uh, men and women at that time, since that's, that was the sort of opposition that she was primarily interested in at the time. But you can do a Hegelian analysis of self-recognition and otherization, um, you know, the need for self, the need for recognition and self-recognition and otherization. And, and from that, you, you can derive an understanding of how gender relations work or, or race relations work or any relations for that matter work. And in this process, when, this, when you establish one as the master and the other as a slave, the slave is the other. The story is of the master. The master is the protagonist of the story. story. The slave is nothing but, in a certain sense, uh, someone that is only playing second fiddle, is only playing a supportive role. So the, whereas the master is able to ignore any attempt by the slave to view him as a subject or as the other, uh, the master is able really to dominate the discourse, the narrative, so to speak. But in turning the slave into an object, the master loses, Hegel says, what he tried to gain in the first instance. It appears that the master is victorious. In fact, this is a phyric victory. This is a false victory. Because what the master was really aiming for was recognition by another subject. The subject, however, has been turned into an object. By whom? By the master. Because the slave did not recognize the master out of a sense of free will. The slave only recognized the master for fear of death, out of obedience. You'll be a social outcast or you'll be physically beaten up by me if you do not recognize me as a master, if you do not recognize me, in other words, as a thinking being. So the slave has not recognized the master out of free will, but rather out of obedience, out of fear of death. And because the slave has done so out of fear of death, the slave has been manipulated into doing so. The slave really has been treated by the master, not only as an other, but as an object. What happens after that? Well, the master sets the slave to work, whatever that work may be. It may be economic work. It may also be emotional labor. It may be any kind of labor, but the master gets the slave to serve the master. Now, through the process of labor, the slave, however, develops human civilization. Through the process of labor, the slave, Hegel says, is externalizing his or her subjectivity into the objects of labor. 
Now for Hegel try and understand that whatever humanity creates can be nothing but the externalization of whatever is in the mind of humanity. Hegel also refers to this as alienation because the word external and alien is largely the same thing. To put out of oneself, to externalize from oneself, to take out of the mind and to put into material form an idea, a notion really is the alienation of that notion into material form, says Hegel. So, um, how does this, how can I explain this to you? Well, think of it in this way. When a child or an adult even picks up a paintbrush and wants to make a painting, they first have some conception of what kind of painting that will be. That conception may be very detailed or it may ev uh, continuously evolve as the painting evolves, but there is some conception of where the brush must go before it goes there. Uh, similarly, if I want to make a great work of architecture, I you know, draw up a plan, the plan exists in my mind, it becomes the externalization of what exists in the mind. It is the same with art, it is the same with any form of production. I, I, I conceive it, I plan it, once I conceive and plan it, or even if I don't plan it per se in the very literal sense of the word, I conceive of something that I'm going to create and then I attempt to create it. Now that happens not only at the individual level, but it, that happens at the collective level. We may be conceiving and externalizing what we have conceived or what one person has conceived. Other people may help to externalize that into material, into some material object. This process of alienation of an idea into something material is what Hegel refers to in objectif as objectification of an idea. That is, an idea becomes an object, it becomes something material. And then it only stands to reason that all of civilization, all the art, architecture, all the social structures and all the ideologies, the great works of poetry and the, the religions of various religions of the world, everything, all aspects of civilization are nothing but the externalization of the collective understanding of those particular societies. Um, so if you want to understand, and even today we apply this in the humanities, if I wanted to understand how the Romans thought, what were their dreams, what were their fears, what were their aspirations, I would look at Roman art as the externalization of how the Romans felt about themselves, about the world that they lived in and so on and so forth. If I wanted to understand Mughal, uh, you know, the Mughal mindset, I wanted to understand what was in their mind, how would I get access to their mind? I can't because all those people are dead, but I can get access to the things that their minds created and thereby try to understand from the objects created from their mind what was in their minds because those are the uh, that is the objectification of their of their mental state of their geist of their spirit of their mind but if the objectification of an individual's mind or a society's mind is civilization that means that civilization as a whole really is the is created by those people who play the role of the slave. The slave creates civilization in a certain sense, whether we consider the slavery in the literal sense or we consider slavery in the figurative sense. And of course, there may be people who are themselves slaves and in turn also have slaves. But it is only in their role or in your role as a slave that you actually labor because whenever you have slaves to labor for you, or labor for you in certain aspects or in certain areas, then you don't do the work, you get other people to do the work. But when other people do the work, the things that are created are really the externalization of their consciousness, even though you may possess those things as property or you may be credited with having created those things, but the reality is that you have actually played no role. When I think about the great uh, Egyptian uh, pyramids or when I think about the Taj Mahal, etc., who really created them? Although we credit the, the pharaohs or we credit the Mughal kings, etc., for having created those things, but really the real creators are the people who laid the bricks, who, you know, carved the, the rocks, etc., etc., who really worked on those things, whether intellectually, you know, uh, thought of those particular, uh, you know, how uh, planned those great monuments or worked on those things physically. And I'd like to think, you know, uh, I'd like to think that when the slaves who worked on those things, slaves not necessarily in the literal sense but in the figurative sense here, looked at the things they created, they must have achieved or received some sense of satisfaction by looking at or by examining the, the work that they created. In the great Egyptian pyramids, on the the bricks that are inside these in, incredible pyramids are the names of the workers who created those pyramids. 
there is a sense of ownership there is a, that is sort of reaching back through time to tell us about the real people who built those uh, brick by brick built those pyramids all of civilization therefore is built really Hegel says by the slave now here's where the the fun bit begins the dialectical inversion begins the irony of history begins the slave is now able to rediscover him or herself as the creator of civilization and the real subject of history if everything that is created is nothing but the externalization of our mind, our creative ability, then all of civilization is the externalization of the mind of those people who have worked for other people. And therefore, civilization is really nothing but the externalization of the consciousness of those people who have worked, that is slaves. Now the slave, by viewing the externalization of their own mind, is able to receive recognition of themselves as thinking beings by examining what they have created, human civilization as a whole. And we're not talking about individual things that we create, although we also see this process at the individual level. When I sit in my room and I play guitar, there may be nobody who's listening, but if I play guitar well, I feel a sense of innate satisfaction. I give myself evidence that I'm a thinking creative being. I'm a good musician. When a child draws a painting and it doesn't, you know, when a child feels that they have done a good job with that painting. They've created something they hadn't created before. They've done something new. A child automatically feels a degree of satisfaction in their ability to create something new. They have given themselves evidence that they are creative beings. They do not necessarily require the approval of anyone else in order to recognize that they have done something that is creative, that is new, that is different, and that they have, you know, in a, in a certain sense, they have expanded their own capacities, abilities, and creative power. That really is what is happening at a vast collective level in history. That the slave, ironically, no longer requires recognition from the master as a subjective being, because the slave is able to receive that recognition but just from the fact that the slave, him or herself, or collectively rather, is the real subject of history, is the real thinking power behind history, is the real creative power behind history. And all the masters have really done and contributed nothing to history. Now this inverts the dialectic between the slave and the master. The slave no longer requires a recognition by the master, it comes out in a stronger position. And the master, who believes that they have the recognition of the slave, discovers that they have nothing but a fairic victory because, a false victory because, the slave is only given recognition to the master as an object rather than as a subject. The master never, never received recognition from the slave as a subjective being, but only as an object. Now, history turns. The, the slaves become dominant in the master's fall. Hegel says the essence of the mind is freedom, and its development therefore must consist in breaking away from the restrictions imposed on it in its others by nature and human institutions. How does uh, mankind emerge into this state of freedom? It can only emerge into this state of freedom when a certain stage is created where um, subjects are able to recognize each other as subjects rather than try to reduce each other into objects, into others. And this can only happen when after a certain stage of development where humanity has externalized its own consciousness into civilization and therefore no longer requires recognition from another subject to understand that they are a subject. They get that recognition as a subject from the things that they have objectified, created, that is from civilization itself. So there has to be a process of history whereby the externalization of the mind, civilization, achieves a certain level of development before the slave can emancipate themselves, before a stage is reached where the slave as a whole, all the slaves collectively, no longer require recognition from the master and the master-slave dialectic ends and humanity is able to recognize each other or treat each other not as objects any longer but purely as subjects. So again, this whole historical transformation has to go through three stages. The first is the realm of complete freedom, a state of nature, so to speak, where uh, we are not yet aware or we have not tried to convert each other into objects. In the second stage of history, where uh, various subjects have confronted each other and turned each other into objects, we enter into a stage of history that 
Hegel refers to as the yoke of necessity. Here we are forced to recognize the rights of others. We create morality, we create states, we create religions, we create um, uh, legal codes, uh, uh, we create the notion of rights and so on and so forth. And this is the nearly the entire period of recorded history according to Hegel. And next Hegel says we are going to enter into or for Hegel have already entered into a third stage of human history, a stage of social morality where the recognition of individuality and collective interests come together, where we are not fighting with each other. We don't just have the recognition of individuality as Hegel thought had existed uh, you know, in his time in Europe, but we have also, and that was really his critique of the Enlightenment and of liberalism generally, but we recognize that we are part of a collective whole, that we have collective interests as humanity, we have collective interests together with nature, uh, and the conception of ourselves as being disconnected uh, entirely from nature, the conception of ourselves of this of constantly only being in contradiction with nature or constantly only being in contradiction with other people will come to an end when we we'll recognize that although there may be contradictions with nature and with other individuals, but there is also there are also collective shared interests. So individuality or individual interests and collective interests will be able to reconcile. Hegel puts this in another wonderful uh, way. He says the first stage is a stage of art where the mind has an intuitive contemplation of itself. It does not have a contemplation of itself uh, out as a result of the objectification of its own creation, but only very intuitively grasps its uh, uh, contemplation of itself. The next stage is the stage of history where the mind feels the superiority of itself to the particularization limitations of finite things. In other words, the mind in this sta new stage feels its own limitations, its individuality and its uh, contradiction with other um, uh, with other beings, with other uh, individuals of society, there is a contradiction between the individual and the collective interest of society. And this undergoes, of course, three great moments in the development of religions. There is first and foremost for Hegel, Oriental religions, in which the, he says, the Oriental religions exaggerated the idea of the infinite. By infinite here, Hegel, of course, means God. He means uh, you know, the geist, the mind that has everything within it. Um, in the Oriental religions, Hegel writes, only one person is free. That is, of course, the ruler. Because for Hegel, he believed that uh, in his time, of course, this was quite a, a common idea in, amongst historians, that um, the idea of the worship of the king, considering the king divine or the manifestation of God on earth, was essentially an oriental idea. It was essentially an idea that came to the west from Babylon, from Mesopotamia, from Egypt, etc., and further even from the east, etc. So it was an eastern idea because in the east the king was always uh, venerated as a god on earth, whereas for Hegel he thought that the Greco Roman religion did not consider their rulers to be divine. And so that, of course, is the second stage for Hegel, the Greek and Roman religion, which gave for which Hegel also criticizes because he says that Greek and Roman religions gave undue importance to the finite, that is to the individual, to the individual. However, even under Greek and Roman religion, a class of people was considered free, they had individuality, whereas there was a the majority of people was still in the serf class, a slave class, and they still remained non-human. In the third stage of evolution, we get Protestant Christianity. We get Christianity by which Hegel, of course, really means Protestant Christianity. Now, this, he says, is the, you know, is the, is the, is the development of religion to a new stage. That is, Protestant Christianity represents the union of the infinite and the finite of God and man. Hegel writes, every individual is considered free by virtue of being human and that the freedom of spirit comprises our most human nature. This is very, very important because this Hegel considers to be the philosophical foundation of Protestant Christianity that we must extract from Christianity. We must extract from Protestantism or from Christianity this essential principle and then we will understand what really is absolute knowledge and this he says absolute knowledge this understanding of every individual being free by virtue of being a human being a thinking being is the starting point of science and is the starting point of philosophy 
Hence, for Hegel, philosophy transcends the limitations imposed on it in religion and attains absolute truth in the form of reason. We have to extract for Hegel what is, uh, what is contained within Christianity, its foundation of, being, of considering all humans as being free and equal. That is what philosophy does for Hegel, extracts from religion its, uh, its uh, logical foundation. Hence, for Hegel, all the truth in art and religion is now contained in philosophy in a higher form. Philosophy is therefore, Hegel says, quote, the highest, freest and wisest phase of the union of subject and objective mind, subjective and objective mind, and the ultimate goal of all development, unquote. So now you can see that this will also set up a contradiction between those who consider Christianity to be who, those who interpret Christian, Christianity in a very different way, in the traditional way. Because Hegel here is interpreting Christianity in a very, very unorthodox way, in, a, in a, an almost pantheistic way, in a way in which he is trying to say that Christi there is a logical, philosophical core within Christianity which is more important than all the rituals of Christianity. But you may ask, why Christianity, why Protestantism after all? And that's a good question and the first answer of course is that Hegel is very much a, a person of his times. You can consider that Hegel was very much biased. He was of course German, he was brought up in Germany, you know, so and Germany was dominated by Protestantism and so we can consider that of course he is the product of his times, etc. But his own point of view of course is that in this form uh, Christianity renounces particular interests, that is individual interests. It renounces the idea that um, individuality is important and it stresses the idea that every individual is free and equal by virtue of being human. But what about Jesus Christ then? How would Hegel understand uh, Jesus' struggle or, or what Jesus means to humanity? In his famous essay, The Life of Jesus, Hegel argues that man's separation from God is not the result of trespassing on a fig tree. Rather, the myth is symbolic of the, of the divide between individuality and universal reason. In other words, what the Bible is talking about should not be understood literally, but should be understood metaphorically. And what we need to do is to understand the, the rational kernel that is contained within the biblical narrative. So Jesus for Hegel is a rationalist philosopher who taught ethics um, and all the miracles were uh, metaphysical or psychological experiences rather than actual physical incidents. For Hegel, therefore, Christianity combines the finite with the infinite, our physical and mental natures into one spiritual unity. But religion itself, all of religions when we examine that, not just Protestant Christianity, in the Hegelian system, all religions are the expression of the fear of objectification in the struggle for self-identification. Why? Because the individual or society or the slave or even the master takes some comfort in a being that is God that exists purely for itself, that requires no self-recognition. This provides a refuge of the individual from the unhappy consciousness that is created, the unhappiness that is created um, uh, out of the desire to be recognized and the failure of other subjects to recognize themselves. So in the Hegelian system, religion that is all religions are but, but stages in the evolution of human consciousness. Uh, and religion is not therefore the highest stage of consciousness, but only self-consciousness in pictorial or poetic form. So although religion and reason are reconciled in the Hegelian system, uh, because of course this was one of the big debates in his time and uh, you know, rationalists and empiricist philosophers etc. were trying to reconcile reason and religion or not trying to reconcile reason and religion. But they're reconciled in a way in which reason is not merely the struggle first and foremost to create formal universal categories that can explain individual phenomena as Plato or Aristotle would have had us believe. It is not just a process in which we try to understand whether we have understood atomic theory correctly or not or whether we've cat categorized mules and horses correctly. For Hegel, reason involves a self-conscious self ego person struggling to assimilate objects, that is to try and understand objects, while at the same time having to fend off 
their otherness, which is a threat to its existence as a self-conscious being, while at the same time trying, trying to also be recognized as a thinking being. That is why what we call reason is constantly itself an evolving phenomena. How we understand reason has changed from time to time. What we have considered to be reason in the past, we no longer consider to be reason. Reason, the idea of reason, what is reasonable even, what is logical even, what is moral, what is right, what is just, has been undergoing a transformation throughout history. And this transformation has occurred by our externalizing what was in the mind. So for Hegel, the objective mind is the mind objectified in law. By objectified, we means where it comes out of ourself in the form of law, in the form of morality, in the state. So as I was saying, in the Hegelian system, uh, reason and revelation are reconciled in favor of reason. Hegel says, and I quote, reason in its most concrete representation is God. God governs the world. The content of his governance, the fulfillment of his plan is world history. And Hegel sums this up by saying the real is rational and the rational is real. What does this, what does this sentence mean? Well, what Hegel means by that is that the mind, the geist, the spirit is really what is real. It is. From this, these logical categories of the mind, the geist, God, emanates the entire world. There's a splintering, an emanation that creates the entire material world, right? So the real is created on the foundation of that which was rational. God is nothing other than reason. But when the material world is created out of God, that is nothing other than reason, it appears to us splintered. We are part of that material world. When we try to understand that material world, we create certain rational categories to understand that material world. We create certain universal categories. Our reason, our attempt to understand that material world is nothing other than an attempt to understand that which created this material world, the logic, the foundation, the, the spirit, the guys that created this, this material world. And so when our reason, our rationality evolves slowly as it understands the material world, as it understands ourselves in this material world, what we are really understanding is nothing other than the mind of God, which is nothing other than reason. So to sum up, God is reason. Reason creates the world. Everything that the world creates is reason splintered into hundreds and thousands of little millions of systems. Our attempt to understand the material world and ourselves in the material world is nothing but our attempt to realize and understand God. It is nothing but our attempt to understand ourselves. We are part of that material world. We are part of that spiritual world. The spiritual and the material really cannot essentially be separated for Hegel in this sense that although Hegel believes there is matter, matter really exists, he's not a pure idealist, he's an objective idealist, but that the, the foundation of the material world and the foundation of the spiritual world are one and the same and both of, the foundation of both these things is nothing other than dialectics. So if we understand dialectics, we understand how nature works, if we understand dialectics, we understand how we as thinking being works and if we understand dialectics, we understand how logic works how reason works, we understand how the spirit works, we understand how the geist works, we understand really how divinity works, how God works, what is the foundation principle of everything. So in this way, Hegel attempts to reconcile reason and religion, but he, uh, he reconciles reason and religion in favor of reason rather than revelation. On the basis of Hegel's dialectical understanding of how the individual relates to matter, the individual relates to other individuals or to society in general, understands him or herself or understands themselves and how the spiritual and the material relate to each other, Hegel opens up his critique of the Enlightenment. His principal critique of modernity in the Enlightenment is that, that the principle of individual rights that we have inherited from liberalism is deeply flawed in that it posits a universal individual without any particular traits and without reference to social or cultural environment or to any empirical details about the individual. Now when you 
take away all the empirical details about an individual, their race, their gender, their color, their nationality, their culture, their social origins, their, the, the actually existing society in which they live, what are you left with? Nothing but an abstract individual, an individual that is empty of any characteristics. And what emerges from an abstract individual can, nothing, can be nothing other, Hegel says, than abstract rights because we know nothing about the actually concrete individuals. We know individuals in civil society or we know individuals in the liberal discourse or in the enlightenment discourse only as abstractions. And therefore what we extract from abstract individuals can only be abstract from abstract universal subjects can only be abstract universal rights. But when we actually look at any given society, Hegel says, we first understand that any given society has an ethical life. What is an ethical life? Ethical life consists in the feeling, the consciousness and the will, not of the individual personality and its interests, but of the common personality and interests of all the members in general." Unquote. You understand here that on the basis of the moral and ethical foundations, collective ethical foundations, of a given society, we have the creation of a family, says Hegel, civil society and the state. Of course, uh, in the period of Aristotle, you only have the family and the state, but in the period of uh, Hegel, he considers that this has transformed into, again, another tripartite decision, uh, division because Hegel loves dialectics. So let's go into this, this division. At the first level is the family, which Hegel con considers to be the domain of love and the domain of altruism. Now you may scratch your head and you may say, well, my, uh, you know, my brother uh, or my sister has, is very selfish and never listens to me, etc., etc. But insofar as a family entertains the idea of selfishness, the family really breaks down. The ethos of the family is pure selfishness, altruism, in a certain sense. The ethos of a family is communism, according to, to Hegel, although he doesn't use that word naturally. From there, we get to the next dialectical stage, which um, in the thought process here, which is civil society. Civil society, in a certain sense, is the direct opposite of the family. Uh, by civil society, Hegel doesn't mean what we refer to as civil society today. He means economic society, commercial society. He means econom the economic realm. In the economic realm, says Hegel, property is the embodiment of personality and individuality. This is the realm of individuality. This is the realm of self selfishness. But in civil society, the fact that we order civil society, that is, we order the economy in, in, in our understanding, we order production in our understanding of individual interests, this leads to the polarization between the rich and the poor. It leads to the polarization between the individual and collective interests. And Hegel criticized the, all the Enlightenment theorists for neglecting this particular aspect, that civil society is based on individualism and a kind of individualism that always views in the other individual nothing but a challenge or a threat to our interests. Never an individual with whom we can combine to achieve our goals and objectives. And that of course is true for Hobbes and that of course is also true for Locke and for so many other of the uh, social contract theorists and liberals of, um, Mac uh, sorry, of Hegel's period and remains true even of liberals today. Now in the third stage, Hegel talks about religion uh, and the state. Hegel says the state has its roots in religion. The state has arisen from the ethical life given by religion. And it's only through the state that modern individuality, that is property, can be reconciled with collective belonging, that is with society's general interests as a whole. The state is the arena in which the contradiction of modern life, therefore for Hegel, can be dialectically sublated. Hence the state is the highest embodiment of the fundamental idea that animates society. Now here Hegel will find himself directly in contradiction to the um, individualists and libertarians who consider the state to be um, oppressive by virtue of its collectivism, uh, but Hegel is not uh, thinking of the state in this particular way. Neither is Hegel a pure collectivist in the sense that he does not consider individual interests to be important. Rather, he considers individuality to be important, but also social interests to be important, and he considers only that the, that the realm, the region in which individuality and collective interest can be reconciled is nothing other than the state. It cannot be reconciled in the family, which does not entertain the idea of individuality at any level or shape or form. They cannot be reconciled in the 
aspect of civil society or in the realm of civil society because that is not a realm that entertains in any form the notion of collective interest. So where can they be reconciled only and only in the state? So the criticism of Hegel, uh, of Hegel or Hegelians as being pro-state in the sense of as being only collectivists, uh, uh, you know, I think by liberals, I think uh, may rest on a certain uh, misreading of Hegel. So in other words, for Hegel, the spirit is objectified as law, morality and the state. And this engenders a contradiction. The contradictions that exist in society between the individual and collective interest, between the family and civil society, etc. These are manifested in this realm of politics, in the realm of the state. And these are only sublated and overcome, negated, etc. in the realm of politics, leading to a new, more complex idea, a more complex state, a more complex kind of society that can overcome the contradictions of the past society or uh, let's say of the present and create a new kind of society taking the place of the old. So this is the dialectical process that, un that unfurls uh, human history. This is how human history continues forward in a dialectical spiral, evolving from the simple to the more complex through internal contradictions. Hence, to summarize Hegel's philosophy of history, civilization, that is everything we have built, art, architecture, social structures, ideologies, is, is the externalization of the Geist, is the externalization of the collective mind of humanity. Hence, this process is the Geist coming to know itself, because mankind is coming to know no other force but itself. It is the unity of the spiritual and the material. But Hegel has a very interesting idea and the idea is that history in his own period has come to an end. Now the fundamental precondition for history, come to an, for history to come to an end is that the subject and the object, that is the dialectic between the subjective and the objective must reconcile, must be sublated. How can this come about? What, is, what does that mean? The, the dialectic of history can only come about first and foremost where the social and the individual are reconciled in a social individual. An individual that recognizes their individuality but also recognizes collective interests. Therefore, when humanity is able to reconcile individual and collective interests, that will only be, that will be the precondition for the end of history. The other is that the subject, the ultimate subject, that is God, and the object, the material world, the spirit, the geist, the notion, the logical reason, rationality that has animated the world, the world as it exists, the material world, are reconciled. That is, the subject and object are ultimately reconciled. Our understanding of matter and spirit are ultimately reconciled. When humanity, in other words, is able to see each other not just as objects but as subjects and humanity is able to understand, apparent contradiction between the material and the spiritual is only just an apparent contradiction. In fact, the underlying logic of both the spiritual and the material is one and the same. And this, of course, means that Hegel wants to see the reconciliation of the infinite, that is God, and the finite, that is man. Man is, of course, finite in the sense that we live only for a brief period of time, and also in the sense that we are one part of the collectiveness of all of humanity. Each individual is one part of the collectivity of all of humanity. So the reconciliation of the finite and the infinite is the unity of man and God, the unity of matter and spirit, where humanity is able to understand that the rational is after all real and the real is after all only rational. Spirit and matter are one and the same thing. And humanity is able to treat each other not as an object, but is able to treat each other as a subject. That will bring about for Hegel the end of history. Now, Hegel thought that that moment had come about with the French Revolution in the world of politics and with the birth of dialectical philosophy, his own writing in the realm of philosophy. That will be all for today. I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share and uh, you know, continue watching these lectures. I hope you enjoyed this one and learned a lot. Signing out for today. Thank you so much.